Welcome everybody to the Tripolitan. My name is Rafat Yamak. Today we have an episode on uh, on an event that has been um, basically dominating the headlines all over global uh, media outlets. Uh, it's an event that has caught the world by surprise. Um, at least uh, people who aren't uh, familiar with this area or or region. Uh, and that topic would be Afghanistan and the recent Taliban takeover of the country and the transfer of power from the previous administration under Ashraf Ghani to the Taliban. So with that, we have a very special guest today. His name is um, Sangar, Sangar Paikhar. So Sangar Paikhar is a host of the Afghan Eye podcast. Born in Kabul, Afghanistan, he arrived in the Netherlands at the age of 12. He is a freelance journalist and a graduate from the School of Governance and Global Affairs in The Hague. Sangar, thank you so much for having me. And please let me know if I mispronounce your last name. Uh, thank you very much. That's all right. Uh, my last name is actually Paikar. Paikar, okay. But, uh, you know, that's, uh, that comes with a territory. As a refugee in the Netherlands, our translator was uh, Iranian. And uh, we didn't have any documents, so my mother uh, told him, our last name is Paikar, but uh, for some reason he wrote it down with K H A R, and uh, if you want to change your last name, you have to apply uh, uh, for it, and then you have to go to court and spend six, seven months arguing and paying a lot of money. <laughs> so I felt like uh, <laughs> I don't care; <laughs> it's it's fine like this. I feel like so many people, especially immigrants, uh, that when they arrive to the U.S., somehow their name gets, you know, uh, their last name gets messed up or like their last name is like their dad's first name and all kinds of things happen. So, <laughs> but yeah, if it's a headache, I guess I can see why you don't want to pursue it. Yeah, I, I, I'm fine. You know, I, it, it's not like people pronounce your name correctly, even if it's correctly spelled. So what point. does it matter? <laughs> That's a good point. That's a good point. Um, so Sankar, obviously, um, you know, uh, I followed you on, uh, on Twitter and you definitely, mashallah, you have a uh, great analysis, uh, and, uh, it seems that, you know, you've studied the region very closely. Uh, with that, we're just going to kind of delve into, um, you know, the recent events that have kind of transpired. But before we do, I wanted to kind of just get a bit of a context, uh, about the Taliban movement for the audience, especially. So kind of just briefly, if you can go over who are the Taliban? Uh, when were they founded? Kind of just a brief history um, about this movement. Well, uh, Afghanistan is, uh, for a large part, a still a pre-modern country, uh, meaning that uh, after the Enlightenment, uh, most Western European countries uh, had a process where they moved ahead uh, economically, uh, socially, and politically. And as a result of that, they colonized a lot of uh, other countries in other parts of the world. And you see some sort of uniformity with Western countries and other countries that were colonized. However, that's not the case in Afghanistan. Afghanistan uh, remained uh, uh, isolated from uh, most other developments around the world. So the society is very traditional and very conservative. So if you leave the city, if you leave Kabul, uh, the society has remained intact, uh, in like social norms, values and beliefs of people are pretty much the same uh, as uh, they were uh, hundreds of years ago in other parts of the world. So uh, for that reason, uh, in Afghan society, imams, uh, religious scholars, they have a special status as people who are often involved in people's uh, social affairs, religious affairs. Um, and uh, being a pre-modern society, it means that uh, people always have some sort of reverence and respect for uh, imams and uh, anyone who has some sort of religious uh, education and they serve their communities. Uh, what happened in the last 40 years in Afghanistan is that uh, first after the communist revolution, a lot of Afghans joined the resistance. They became part of the what is called the Mujahideen. Mm -hmm. 
And these Mujahideen consisted of various groups. Some of them were uh, inspired by Ikhwan al-Muslimin, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Um, others were uh, traditional Sufi uh, leaders in Afghanistan. Uh, they didn't have a, a real political uh, ideology and doctrine. And uh, you had other uh, people who were part of the resistance but they were uh, religious scholars, imams. They were neither with uh, uh, royalist Sufis nor with the uh, Muslim Brotherhood inspired groups. Uh, okay. So those groups, they were uh, scattered around the country and they were uh, loosely tied to different groups, but they were not really uh, organized as one uh, political entity because uh, they don't have a uh, political ideology like uh, Muslim Brotherhood or, uh, for instance, the Salafi Jihadis or the secularists or the nationalists, etc. Mm -hmm. So these groups, they are mainly focused on their own uh, local communities, their own uh, religious education, etc. So f those groups existed in Afghanistan. They were not organized. However, when the Soviet Union was defeated in Afghanistan and subsequently after a while the communist regime collapsed, um, all these different factions, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood inspired groups like uh, Hizb Islami, Jamiat Islami, Etihad Islami, uh, and you had some uh, Shiite uh, groups like uh, Hizb Wahdat, all these different parties started fighting each other. Uh, and the country was uh, divided into small fiefdoms. Uh, it was a total anarchy. You know, um, some of you may have uh, read uh, Thomas Hobbes' uh, Leviathan, mm -hmm. uh, when they say the Hobbesian state of nature, uh, where there's total anarchy, there's no government. That was the state of affairs in Afghanistan in the early 1990s. And these religious scholars and uh, imams and uh, students uh, of uh, uh, religious madrasas across the country, they were not actively involved in the civil war. And in fact, some of them even tried to uh, reconcile different groups and make peace between them, but they failed. However, when the abuses and uh, oppression against the uh, normal average, you know, civilians uh, became uh, intolerable, that's when uh, Mullah Muhammad Omar, uh, who was a uh, imam in uh, Kandahar uh, province of Afghanistan, he was uh, approached by local uh, uh, citizens. They said that there are these warlords and they're being very abusive, they're kidnapping people, they're raping people. You guys need to uh, help us. And this is also tied to what I said initially. We live in a very pre-modern, conservative, traditional society where people have some sort of reverence and respect for imams and scholars. So that's why people approach them, okay? Because there was no other authority, there was no other uh, 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 entity that could have some sort of respect and, um, uh, yeah, for that reason, people approached uh, Mullah Omar and he decided to take his students from his madrasa and they went after the local uh, warlords mm -hmm. and soon after that they uh, took the whole city and uh, defeated all the local warlords most of them fled to uh, pakistan or other countries and once this uh, group became organized uh, religious scholars from other parts of the country all uh, started uh, to support this movement because they said that if they can bring stability there Maybe they can bring stability in the rest of the country. And this explains the success of Taliban movement uh, in the 90s uh, because uh, they managed to uh, secure the whole country within two years. Uh, people from all parts of the country, they saw them as uh, a solution for the anarchy in the country. Mm -hmm. Now, that being said, it doesn't mean that the Taliban were not uh, involved in uh, human rights violations, abuses, uh, killing people, massacres, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, they have uh, had fair share of their own, uh, you know, uh, abuses and war crimes uh, and everything. But this is the basically the background of uh, the Taliban. Uh, so when we talk about Taliban, people often think that it's a political ideology, just like uh, you know 
know, Al Qaeda has a Salafi jihadi right. ideology. It has a global agenda. Uh, the Muslim Brotherhood it has a political ideology. Uh, uh, different uh, religious movements like Hizb al Tahrir, etc. Yes. They all have an, a, a political ideology that really uh, has a global uh, uh, outlook. But the Taliban never had that and they still don't. Uh, they're very much oriented towards their own communities, their own country. Uh, and this is why they're also very misunderstood uh, because uh, people just see long beards, turbans and uh, Kalashnikovs and they say, okay, these guys are coming after us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, that's, <laughs> that's not actually uh, very accurate. You, you know, I think, um, I mean, I saw this comment and he's like he's a person on Twitter who has a considerable following, and he writes that these Taliban, these Salafi Wahhabis, and I'm like thinking to my head, no, they're not that <laughs> Diobandi. And you yeah. know, if actually this would be actually a great way if you can just explain what 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 is a Diobandi school, and you know the Taliban they espouse that kind of school of thought. What what is the Diobandi school basically? So uh, we have four schools of uh, thought in uh, Islamic uh, law mm -hmm. uh, among the Sunnis. Uh, and these four schools of uh, jurisprudence, uh, we have the Hanafi, Maliki, Hanbali, and Shafi'i. Uh, the, the, the region, uh, the, the, the Indian subcontinent and Afghanistan, the Central Asian republics, they're all Hanafi. Okay. Mm -hmm. However, the Hanafi school is uh, also very diverse. It's not a monolith. Mm -hmm. So there are different strands of Hanafi uh, jurisprudence. Uh, but in the Indian subcontinent, uh, what happened is that uh, uh, there was a movement of revivalist uh, scholars, uh, most notably uh, Shah Waliullah Dehlawi, Mm -hmm. uh, was a, f a very uh, a prominent uh, scholar from uh, from India, and uh, he uh, revived some of uh, important, you know, um, s Islamic sciences such as uh, the science of Hadith, mm -hmm. you know, the traditions of uh, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and other uh, sciences. And uh, uh, as a result of this revivalist movement. Uh, different uh, movements emerged in the subcontinent, especially uh, in initially in during the Mughal era in the subcontinent, but later during the British occupation of uh, the subcontinent. Uh, what happened is that uh, one of these movements that emerged out of that uh, period was the Deobandi movement in, the, in northern India. So the population in northern India, uh, the Muslim population, consists for a large part from uh, ethnic Pashtuns from Afghanistan. Uh, Pashtuns are uh, originally a semi-nomadic uh, pastoralist uh, uh, community of uh, people from uh, Afghanistan. And they would traditionally move with their, uh, uh, you know, with their cattle, etc., across uh, large parts of Central Asia. And some of them settled in northern India, all the way up to Myanmar. Mm -hmm. And these communities of uh, Pashtun settlers, uh, um, a, a few prominent figures among them were involved in setting up a madrasa uh, in northern India, in, in Deoband, which is a small town. Mm -hmm. And that's why when they say the Obandi, they refer to people who are either inspired or they uh, have studied in Darul Ulum Deoband in northern mm -hmm. India. Mm -hmm. Now that was more than 100 years ago, but uh, the Deobandi movement was one of the many uh, groups in northern India who were involved in the um, anti-imperialist struggle. Uh, they wanted to liberate uh, uh, India from uh, British occupation. And uh, the Ubandis, because of their cultural and uh, religious ties with the rest of the region, they became the most influential and the most powerful uh, group uh, also in Afghanistan. So many Afghan Hanafi scholars are either graduates from Darul Ulum Deoband uh, in India, or they have studied in other madrasas, like in Pakistan and other uh, areas, 
uh, that have emerged after uh, students of Deoband have set, set up their own uh, institutions of learning. Mm -hmm. But the, to say that the Taliban are all Deobandi, that would be inaccurate because okay. uh, uh, many uh, Taliban, uh, important figures within the Taliban have not studied with Deobandis. They have studied in Afghanistan with uh, traditional uh, imams and uh, scholars who have never traveled uh, to study in India or in Pakistan. Uh, we had our own uh, uh, institutions uh, not as prominent our, as Deoband or Al-Azhar in Egypt or any other uh, famous uh, institution. Very small, very uh, 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 obscure, but we had our own uh, institutions of learning. So uh, there are many uh, people in Afghanistan who are seen as Deobandi because they're conservative uh, Hanafis. They're very classical in their way of interpreting mm -hmm. uh, Hadith and, you know, uh, interpreting Quran, mm -hmm. uh, other uh, sources of, uh, you know, uh, uh, law in Islam. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're not uniformly Deobandi. Uh, like even within the uh, uh, Taliban movement, there are also some who are part of uh, Sufi movements who right. may be not really aligned with the Deobandi ideology, mm -hmm. but they have joined the Taliban movement uh, because uh, they uh, see this as an umbrella movement that supports their cause, preservation of uh, tradition, preservation of independence and uh, preservation of, you know, the religious conservative nature of society in Afghanistan. Right. I mean, that's, uh, thank you so much, uh, Sangar, honestly, for going through that, because it's an important distinction. Many times, you know, people just see somebody, as you said, with a turban and a beard, and they think he's Salafi Wahhabi, and they can't, you know, <laughs> it just completely erase, erases the nuances of, of each region. Uh, so I thank you for that summary. I wanted to ask you as well, um, you know, you mentioned Mullah Omar in the beginning, and, uh, you know, Mullah Omar, there's many people that have met him. Uh, among, among One of them that I recently kind of came across was uh, Nafisi. Who's like a, he's a Kuwaiti diplomat and he's traveled across the world and he's met different people. And he basically, one of the comments he made about this person was that he commands respect, this person. He was able to command respect from, you know, this disparate number of groups and he just united them together and he was able to enforce power and, and control basically. And kind of moving on from, from, from Mullah Omar, even as you go on, Mullah Omar has a very, his name, you know, rings many bells. A lot of people know his name. But after Mullah Omar, you realize that, or at least, you know, for people that kind of maybe witness or follow Afghanistan from a, from a distance, there isn't really that strong of a central leadership, maybe. Like, I bet you if I can, if I, you know, a lot of these people that are, you know, pontificating about Afghanistan and Taliban, if I ask them who is the current leader of Taliban, I doubt they would even know his name, truly. Uh, he's, he's not very um, involved, it seems like, on like the, you know, in the forefront. Would you agree with that assessment? Uh, yes, I agree. And that's also uh, very typical for uh, the conservative uh, imams in Afghanistan. For instance, uh, most of these uh, conservative imams are against uh, photography. Uh, mm -hmm. They believe that uh, we should not uh, take pictures or uh, uh, put people uh, in front of a camera because they see that creation of uh, images as uh, as a sin. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the most important reasons why also Mullah Omar refused to appear in front of a camera. Uh, and likewise, many other prominent leaders of uh, Taliban uh, still have an aversion towards cameras. Uh, because they say that, you know, from a religious perspective, you know, we as Muslims, we are against idols, we are against mm -hmm. uh, depiction of uh, uh, animate beings, and for that reason, they uh, also don't want to appear in front of cameras. Uh, that's one major issue that most people need to uh, realize, that that's the reason why were, they were so, quote-unquote, secretive. Uh, the other uh, aspect is that uh, um, when they were involved in uh, armed conflict uh, with other groups, uh, but especially after 2001, uh, 
uh, they were all on a, a list, targeted list, and uh, the United States was trying to eliminate all their leaders. Mm -hmm. So for that reason, the current Amir or the current supreme leader of the Taliban, whose name is uh, Hibatullah Akhundzada, mm -hmm. he uh, is nowhere to be seen. He doesn't want to appear in front of cameras. He doesn't want to be interviewed. And uh, some people even suspect that he doesn't even exist, <laughs> but he wow. actually does exist. Uh, he is a, a scholar uh, who has written many books. Uh, some of his books were even praised by other prominent uh, scholars like uh, uh, Taqi Usmani from Pakistan. Okay. So uh, this person uh, does exist. Hibatullah Akhunzada does exist. He was a religious scholar. Uh, before assuming the role of the Amir uh, of the Taliban movement and other prominent leaders within the Taliban movement who are part of their leadership council. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, so uh, to explain it for our audience, mm -hmm. the Taliban have a supreme leader who is the Amir. Then he has deputies. One of his deputies is Abdul Ghani Bradar. Uh, he is responsible for their political uh, faction. Uh, he was the one who was head of the political office in Doha. Uh, the other deputy of the Amir is uh, uh, Mullah Yaqub. Yaqub is the son of Mullah Omar. Uh, he is also involved in military activities in Afghanistan. And then the other deputy is Sirajuddin Haqqani. Uh, Sirajuddin Haqqani was, uh, yeah, he's the son of another very historic, prominent uh, jihadi figure in Afghanistan and a prominent leader of the Taliban, uh, Jalaluddin Haqqani. Uh, people often make the distinction of the Haqqani network uh, uh, and the Taliban, but uh, in reality, it's just one movement the, the, there is no distinction between them okay. uh, and Sirajuddin Haqqani is the other deputy so okay. under the deputies then there is the leadership council I don't know exactly how many people are member of the leadership council I also don't know who are part of the leadership council uh, we know of one person who has been recently uh, in the media at least there were pictures and videos of him uh, his name is Fasihuddin and Fasihuddin is a scholar from the northern Badakhshan province of Afghanistan. And like him, there are a few other people who ha have been identified as leaders, uh, as members of the leadership council. But we don't know all their names. We don't know uh, who they are. Uh, but people in Afghanistan, who people who are from rural Afghanistan, people who have been involved in religious education and politics, they know more about it. Uh, I personally... Uh, have heard here and there names, but I haven't received uh, real confirmation of who are exactly part of the leadership council. And they are being secretive about it because they still suspect that uh, their leaders might be targeted and assassinated. Mm -hmm. And that's why you uh, often don't hear much about them. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. And um, so I guess, um, what so I guess you know we can we can clearly see that Taliban they have um, you know it's not it's not a, it's not a homogenous movement at least although there is a predominance of one group over another within but I wanted to kind of ask to see are there other ethnicities that are you know like let's say part of the Taliban network like Tajiks or Uzbeks or or is it just primarily Pashtun like you know even in the leadership council. Uh, the leadership council, uh, the one person that I mentioned, uh, Fasihuddin, is mm -hmm. an ethnic Tajik. Okay. Um, his, from, from, his background is from, uh, he was, uh, I, I think, in, initially in the first part of his life, he was involved in uh, Jamiat Islami, mm -hmm. uh, which was a Muslim Brotherhood inspired uh, group. Mm -hmm. uh, and likewise, there are many Uzbeks. Uh, part of the Taliban movement. There are Nuristanis. So Nuristanis are another ethnic group in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They're neither Tajik, neither Pashtun. Uh, and uh, the thing with the uh, Taliban is that uh, they are f often seen as primarily a Pashtun movement because their leader emerged out of Kandahar. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the spiritual capital of Afghanistan, mm -hmm. the predominantly Pashtun area, mm -hmm. and many prominent figures were initially uh, Pashtuns. But mm -hmm. uh, as you know, uh, if you get to know religious communities, uh, you know that for a, a certain extent there are ethnic divisions, but the deeper you go within ethnic communities, you see that the role of ethnicity becomes less important. Mm -hmm. So that's why uh, movements like uh, Taliban, uh, they have many non-Pashtun leaders mm -hmm. and the uh, matter of ethnicity is not really uh, an issue within the organization. Yes, uh, people of different ethnic groups have their own differences. Um, I know that uh, there are some division between uh, Taliban, even among Pashtuns, because Pashtuns are also not a monolith. We have different regions, people speak different dialects, they're from different tribes. There are some cultural nuances between different communities in Afghanistan, even among Pashtuns. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yes, there are non-Pashtuns even in the leadership council of the Taliban. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but uh, I would say that numerically, uh, Pashtuns are the majority. But that's not even uh, something uh, that is unique to the Taliban. Mm -hmm. The communists in Afghanistan were also predominantly Pashtun uh, mm -hmm. because Pashtuns are the largest ethnic group in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. According to some estimates, there are like 40 to 45 percent uh, Pashtuns in Afghanistan. And then there is another aspect to it. Uh, there are people who don't really identify as either Pashtun or as uh, Tajik or anything else because, for example, you have Pashtuns who have lived all their life in the city of Herat mm -hmm. in western Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They speak uh, Persian, mm -hmm. uh, but they're originally Pashtuns uh, from, from, from the, you know, the tribal background, etc. So, so for that reason, you, we uh, often have this misconception that uh, everything is divided along ethnic lines in Afghanistan. That's not true. Yes, people use divisions based on ethnicity to uh, rally support among certain communities, mm -hmm. and that's often a political uh, uh, ploy, you know, they, they do that because they know that if they use some agitation, some uh, uh, differences between ethnic groups, mm -hmm. they might get some support from a particular community. And the Western media, they are, you know, with their Orientalist uh, glasses, when they look at Afghanistan, they just want to uh, see confirmation of their own biases and they put everything into brackets. Okay, this is a Pashtun thing, this is a Tajik thing, this is a Hazara thing. And it, it sort of basically uh, creates a very distorted image of what is going on in Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah there, was one, there was one journalist I saw and he was saying that we need, he, he made some kind of implication that we need to eradicate all Pashtun to get rid of Taliban and some, some kind of weird implication, genocidal implication like that. And that was uh, Michael O'Hanlon, director yeah. of research at the uh, Brookings Institute. Crazy. Uh, and he is saying that uh, basically he oversimplifies everything and he says, Taliban are all Pashtuns. And since Pashtuns are a minority in the north, what we need to do is those small pockets of Pashtuns who are settled in the north, we have to relocate them to the south so that we can that basically ethnically cleanse Pashtuns from the north of Afghanistan uh, because Pashtuns are the only ones who support the Taliban, yeah. which is totally uh, bogus because, uh, for instance, uh, right now, uh, uh, before the collapse of the regime, when different parts of the country started to collapse, what happened is the first regions that collapsed were in the north. And those fighters, I mean, the videos are even on social media. You see people who have this uh, 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 facial features that you know these men are either Uzbek mm -hmm. or they're Turkmen or they're Kazakh or they're uh, Kyrgyz. Uh, they're, they're from et ethnic groups who are in north of Afghanistan. They all speak either Uzbeki or they speak Farsi with mm -hmm. a local dialect. So those men were all locals. 
but uh, for Western audience, for Western analysts, and for Western journalists, you know, facts don't really matter. They just say whatever, you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's digestible for their uh, audience. Unfortunately, yeah, so, unfor unfortunately, yes. there is, there is, there is, yeah, there's always oversimplification when it comes to any, and you know, that, that's why, like, w w you know, with, when I wanted to do, like, an episode on this, I, you know, when I reached out to certain people, I said, please give me a, an Afghan voice who can literally talk about what's going on, because a lot of these, a lot of them, I wouldn't say all, but a lot of these, you know, kind of Western journalists and analysts, they, they just have oversimplification that just, you know, paints the whole region as if it's like two colors and it's way more diverse than that and it's kind of sad to see somebody who's so uh, apparently an analyst on the region and the basics he doesn't even understand yet so um yeah it's just you know pretty crazy i wanted to move on uh sangar uh, sorry did you did you have anything to say sangar before i move no, on no, no, any no. comment no, okay that's... perfect i wanted now to move on to you know the headlines right what's been dominating the news what's been really taking the whole world by, you know, by surprise, I guess. But maybe not so much for uh, Afghanis. Um, basically, the Taliban took over. They took over Kabul. They took over Afghanistan. Uh, they took it over really fast. You know, kind of briefly, if you can just go over, why do you think, you know, a force of 300,000, according to, you know, President Biden, he said there's a force of 300,000 Afghan, Afghan army, and we invested so much money in them, and they just fell apart in the face of the Taliban forces. Why do you think it collapsed so fast? Uh, in order to understand that, we have to understand the nature of warfare in Afghanistan in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. After U.S. invasion, uh, what happened is that uh, they relied heavily on existing militias uh, in Afghanistan, uh, the American Special Forces, and massive air power okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was the initial phase uh, like for instance when the americans uh, started bombing afghanistan uh, the taliban had to retreat from populated areas because they were afraid that uh, cities will be bombed and many civilians will die as much as people uh, like to think that the taliban are all bloodthirsty animals who want to just kill and destroy everyone mm -hmm. uh, they are they are afghans they are from afghanistan mm -hmm. and they see everyone as their own kinsmen so for that reason they had to retreat from the cities uh, so that uh, people they don't get bombed but the the, the 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 air power of the americans has been the dominant factor in the war in the last 20 years mm -hmm. what they did is they created a local force the local uh, you know the afghan national army the afghan lo uh, national police force uh, and then they have like nine or yeah like uh, i think there are 11 different types of special forces that were created in afghanistan mm -hmm. uh, afghans trained by americans uh, the british uh, uh, to be uh, special forces units. Uh, but the bulk of the fighting was done by US Marines, special forces, uh, and uh, close air support. Uh, so the, uh, you know, the air gunships, uh, the helicopters, uh, the AC-10 Warthogs, uh, those uh, American uh, weapons were basically doing most of the fighting you would have small units of special forces in an area that was under threat of uh, being uh, overrun by the taliban they would just identify areas where they expect the taliban to move and they would just bomb everything there mm -hmm. that has been the nature of war for 20 years the local afghan army the local Afghan commandos, you know, the Afghan commandos, uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the local, uh, the, the Afghan air force that they have created, uh, those, the training was predominantly uh, subcontracted to military contractors, okay? okay? So these military contractors would do the training and the maintenance of all their uh, equipment, whether it's the uh, helicopters or airplanes, given to the Afghan government. Everything was being serviced by uh, American contractors. The training was done by American contractors. Uh, mm -hmm. Supplies, everything came from the Americans. So 
It was a local force that was entirely dependent on the private sector in America. And the private sector in America was the biggest beneficiary of the war in Afghanistan, what is often called as the military industrial complex. Right. Yep. And when you organize a, uh, a defense uh, ministry in a country in a way that it is entirely dependent on contractors who are from a different country and you don't invest in uh, local uh, uh, engineers, local uh, uh, institutions that can provide those services, uh, whenever all these uh, foreign elements, these uh, uh, Western contractors, whenever they are removed and the American air power is taken out of the equation, yep. you basically have a bunch of guys with Kalashnikovs mm -hmm. and nothing else. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's the most important reason why uh, the whole country collapsed within 10 days because the Americans stopped providing air support because said, unless you put up a fight and defend a, uh, a region uh, from uh, Taliban, we will not provide you with air support because we, because we are leaving the country. We are, we are gone. We, uh, we're wrapping up. So in most parts of the country, what the Taliban did, that was th their strategy. Um, they would go to local councils. Uh, we have in Afghanistan, in a traditional society, we have a council for everything. So mm -hmm. the, the council of local shopkeepers in a certain village in a district, the council of local doctors in a particular region, the council of local elders, the people with the white beards, you know, the mm -hmm. tribal elders, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. the council of local imams. So the Taliban, they know their society very well, and they know exactly how to exert uh, uh, influence mm -hmm. uh, on a particular community. So what they, what they would do and they, they would approach all these councils and say, listen, the Americans are going, they're leaving, we don't want to fight against the, uh, these boys, our own boys, these soldiers and policemen. If you go and convince them to surrender, we will take the region and we will leave everybody unharmed. Mm -hmm. So all these local councils, they have a vested interest in preserving Mm -hmm. The peace in their community. They cannot afford to say, oh, you know what, let's just see if the army can defeat them. Right. They, ca they can't simply take that risk. So they say, you know what, we will go and talk to the soldiers. And they would go uh, to the garrisons of the army, the, to the police uh, command centers, etc. And they would say, listen, we have talked to the Taliban. They're saying they're not going to kill you. We are giving you assurance as the local council. Mm -hmm. We are uh, uh, standing here as guarantors that they will not kill you or they will not harm you. Let's just surrender. Let's just stop the war. We are all Afghans. Let's just do it. This was the most convincing argument for all these Afghan soldiers. Uh, for that reason, you saw them all surrendering. Because in 10 days all across Afghanistan, there was very little fighting. Mm -hmm. Most areas were just taken without a single f bullet being fired. And that's why basically the Afghan uh, national defense and security forces collapsed so quickly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's honestly incredible that a whole country fell into the, hand, the hands of the Taliban without a single drop of blood. It's, you know, no, whatever. It, it was, no, it, it wasn't without a single drop of blood. There was some fighting. Okay. Like, for instance, um, uh, in some parts of the country, where uh, they uh, deployed special forces. Mm -hmm. And that's a very important point to note that Afghan security forces were uh, heavily relying on uh, special forces. Regular soldiers and police force would barely get any food. The, some of them wouldn't be, be paid for like six, seven months. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't even receive ammunition, supplies to uh, defend their posts. But uh, Afghan uh, uh, special forces were being flown around the country with helicopters and uh, military transport planes to go and fight in different parts of the country. So wherever the government was able to send special forces, there was fighting. Like, for instance, in the city of Lashkargah, they uh, 
bombarded the whole city and told all civilians to leave the city so that they can defeat the Taliban and eventually they, fa they failed. But uh, and similarly in Kunduz, there were many bombardments, like entire shopping centers, markets were all burnt down because mm. of the bombardments because they put up a resistance there and wherever they put up a resistance, the Americans would help them with air power. They would bombard it. Uh, there were B-52 sighted all across the country. Mm -hmm. But where there was, uh, you, you know, you don't have an army of 100,000 special forces. There were like a couple of thousand of them and they couldn't fight in each part of the country. So that's why when they realized they cannot uh, move to each different district uh, within a few minutes, mm -hmm. uh, they saw everything collapse in front of their eyes. That's, uh, that's a good point to make. Uh, so I guess, you know, there was pockets of resistance, but it was just, they were overwhelmed by the, you know, by, by the multiple fronts that were opened, it seems like, all over Afghanistan uh, by the Taliban yeah, exactly. movement. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I, I, I wanted to, um, before we kind of delve into like the future of Afghanistan, I wanted to ask you about, you know, Afghanistan is a landlocked country and it's surrounded by multiple countries. Uh, and each one of these countries, they have their own interests. And you have a huge segment of, you know, of Afghani population that are very, let's say, cautious when it comes to Pakistani involvement, when it comes to Iranian involvement, when it comes to Uzbek involvement. Um, but I think if, I mean, and especially Indian involvement as well. So if you had to... If you had to say, if you had to pick three countries uh, like that are in the regional vicinity of, of Afghanistan, which ones do you think are the most invested in Afghanistan and ensuring that their interests are secured? I would say there are uh, uh, Pakistan, Iran, India, mm -hmm. China, Russia. Mm -hmm. uh, those are the most important actors in the region. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would you, especially, you know, sticking to Iran, because my podcast, generally, we delve into topics that deal with Iranian hegemony in the Middle East, especially, and we're Shia well... Shia Crescent. Exactly, yeah, if you want to, you know, the term that's been coined, I guess. Um, and especially, you know, me being from Lebanon originally, the Iranian presence is very heavily felt. So I wanted, I was wondering, you know, as you know, the Iranians, they've... They've taken, you know, especially poor Afghans, and they've made this, you know, militia called the Fatimiyun. They've sent them all over Syria and, uh, and Iraq. Is there a is there a worry from Afghanis about the Iranian presence in the country? Uh, there are very legitimate and serious concerns. I advise your audience to visit our website, the Afghan Eye dot org, mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, look for an article that uh, we co-authored, me and my colleague Ahmed Walid Kakar. Uh, the article is about the role of Iran in Afghanistan. Uh, if you just uh, go there and search sure. for Iran, it's one of the first articles that appears uh, in the search results. And we explain exactly the role of Iran uh, in Afghanistan after the uh, Iranian uh, revolution, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what role they have played, how they used uh, sectarian differences, how they uh, recruited Afghans uh, if initially in the Iraq uh, Iran war, uh, and how I Iran was involved in creation of uh, resistance groups against Soviet Union in Afghanistan. They were also involved in toppling the Taliban regime. They were uh, supporting uh, the Northern Alliance. Uh, and after 2001, you know, they, uh, although they supported the toppling of the Taliban regime, they also supported the Taliban in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. and, and basically what the Iran strategy in Afghanistan is, is that uh, they play all sides against each other. Okay. Mm -hmm. So they, uh, there was one story uh, years ago that uh, the media uh, discovered that large black bags full of money were being delivered to former president Hamid Karzai mm -hmm. uh, and the money was coming from Iran and uh, when he was asked about it he said yes I received money from Iran mm -hmm. we also received money from United States they're all helping us mm -hmm. but <laughs> at the same time the Iranians were also supplying weapons and uh, uh, other material to the Taliban who were involved in uh, fighting an insurgency against the United States and the government in Afghanistan. Uh, what 
Iran is most interested in in Afghanistan is uh, so that Afghanistan, you know, sh must be prevented from becoming a Sunni powerhouse aligned with uh, the Arab uh, region, you know, the, 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 the Gulf region, mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. uh, and for that reason, they uh, don't want the creation of a very strong centralized government mm -hmm. because they they don't want to be uh, sort of sandwiched by uh, Sunni powerful uh, states mm -hmm. uh, on both sides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And other concern is that uh, most of the water flowing into Iran comes from Afghanistan. So their oh. agriculture, their industry, uh, it all depends from water that flows through the mountains and valleys into western Afghanistan and then eventually into Iran. Now, Afghanistan needs its own water supplies to, uh, to become uh, self-sustained in uh, production of food. Mm -hmm. uh, Afghanistan is not an industri industrialized country. Most Afghans uh, live from subsistence farming. Cultivating uh, food uh, you know, in Afghanistan is very difficult because it's not a flat country uh, you have mountains and uh, uh, you know water is very difficult to manage in a society in, in a country like that so afghanistan is trying to build dams you know the previous regime tried to build dams creation of dams in afghanistan has been on the agenda for the last 50 60 years mm -hmm. but iranians have always seen that as a threat because once those da dams are built it means that less water will flow into iran right. so aside from the fact fact that they uh, have political concerns for Afghanistan. They don't want a hostile uh, regime in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, so they play all cards so, so, that, so that they keep Afghanistan in a, uh, in a very unstable, insecure, underdeveloped condition. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they are also concerns about water. Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing is that, you know, in Iran, uh, religion is a weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, the the twelve Shiite school of thought uh, is being exported by Iranians as uh, a weapon uh, because that's how they uh, spread their influence. Uh, mm -hmm. I know your audience might be aware of the fact that the Zaydis in mm -hmm. uh, Yemen mm -hmm. are not 12 Shiite Imams. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, they, they're not follower of the 12 Imams. Uh, mm -hmm. They have a different strand of Shiism. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, in the last decades, the Iranians have invested heavily in uh, providing education for the Shiites in Yemen and yeah. now those Shiites are very ideologically aligned with Iran. Similarly, the Shiites in Afghanistan, although majority of them are 12 Imami Shiites, uh, they were not as doctrinal and uh, sectarian as, let's say, you know, some groups in Iran and Iraq. But what Iran has done in the last uh, 40 years, and they have provided a lot of scholarships for Shiites from Afghanistan, mm -hmm. now we have many, many uh, prominent uh, Shiite uh, figures in Afghanistan who are educated in Iran mm -hmm. and they're spreading uh, the ideology of the 12, uh, 12ers. Mm -hmm. um, and this creates some tensions, this creates some uh, problems uh, in a predominantly Sunni uh, society. Uh, on the other hand, the Iranians also support uh, Persian nationalists in Afghanistan. So Afghanistan mm -hmm. is a multi-ethnic country. Mm -hmm. There are also uh, people who are uh, Persian speaking, you know, native Persian speakers uh, who speak uh, uh, a, 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 a dialect of uh, Persian mm -hmm. uh, in Afghanistan, which is uh, called Dari. Mm -hmm. But essentially, it's the same language. Mm -hmm. uh, and among them, there are many secularist uh, nationalists. They have sort of similar ideology as the Arab nationalists and uh, uh, Turkish nationalists. They, they believe right. in their own culture uh, uh, and ethnic superiority mm -hmm. and Iranians also try to cultivate those groups mm -hmm. so they, they they are playing everyone they play they, they support the Taliban they supported the previous government they support the Shiite groups mm -hmm. they support uh, secular ethno nationalists mm -hmm. and uh, basically the, the strategy is to keep Afghanistan uh, in a constant state of conflict right right and uh, really, really, really briefly, if you can, 
uh, with the Taliban takeover, can I say in a very simplistic way, Pakistan happy, India sad? Uh, yes and no. Okay. <laughs> That yes, is because <laughs> yes, because yes, because uh, obviously uh, the previous regime was a uh, very uh, pro India, mm -hmm. and uh, the Taliban have very close ties with uh, the uh, Islamic uh, parties in Pakistan, the mm -hmm. Islamic religious institutions, etc., mm -hmm. and they have been supported by the Pakistani army, the Pakistani ISI. Mm -hmm. uh, However, uh, the creation of a Taliban regime in Afghanistan is not in the interest of Pakistan because, like Iran, Pakistan doesn't benefit from a very strong, powerful state in Afghanistan mm -hmm. because uh, they also depend from water in Afghanistan. Okay. But they also have other concerns. You know, Pakistan has many, many, many Islamic parties and movements and very radical groups as well. Mm -hmm. And they are all opposed to the state. They say that the Pakistani state is too secular, mm -hmm. it's too liberal, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and they want to have a uh, sort of Taliban-like uh, emirate in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Now, if pa uh, Taliban succeed in creating a, a very conservative, a very uh, religious uh, regime that is uh, sort of as a model for other Islamist groups, then uh, this may uh, cause many problems for Pakistanis because they would rather see uh, uh, something that is less uh, of an inspiration for those Islamist right. groups. Okay, okay. And uh, so I guess... Um you know, so we talked about the fall of Kabul, why it fell, the different regional actors. Um, I wanted to uh, ask you, basically now we're starting to get into the future, like as we culminate this, this episode, um, do you think the Taliban will succeed in, in ruling Afghanistan? I think it entirely depends on the current negotiations going on in Kabul. Okay. So they are right now... Uh, talking with many prominent leaders from the previous regime. Mm -hmm. They are uh, trying to uh, reach an agreement about future government. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the Taliban will have a major stake in the future government because they consider themselves as the victors. Mm -hmm. But uh, it is in the interest of Taliban to have uh, legitimacy on an international level. Mm -hmm. And they cannot obtain legitimacy on the international level if they create a regime just like they had in the early in the late 90s yep. where it was just basically only Taliban mm -hmm. so now they have uh, uh, given amnesty to everyone even notorious CIA backed warlords uh, mm -hmm. who have killed thousands of Taliban mm -hmm. uh, they uh, they want to create a government where uh, there is some uh, form of uh, inclusion uh, of different groups, different political strands, uh, so that the international community accepts them, mm -hmm. so that they have legitimacy, mm -hmm. and so that they can uh, do business, uh, invite uh, investors, uh, aid organizations uh, uh, to uh, rebuild the country, because the country is devastated by war. We have mm -hmm. a few bubbles here and there of development, like in Kabul, Mazar Sharif, Kandahar, mm -hmm. but the, most of the country where the absolute majority lives, it's totally in shambles and yeah. and and it needs to be uh, rec uh, uh, reconstructed and for that reason taliban uh, uh depend on other political actors in afghanistan to create a uh, government that is internationally uh, recognized and if they fail and uh, if they don't manage to create a government that is acceptable for everyone then I see a very bleak future for Afghanistan. I think that Afghanistan will become totally isolated. Mm. Um, and the people in Afghanistan, we have huge problems. 18 p million people of Afghanistan are under threat of ending up uh, you know, in total famine. There yeah. is hunger, there is lack of medication. We have, still have a pandemic going on in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. The, so for that reason, I think if 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 Taliban uh, create a very uh, isolated regime, uh, hundreds of thousands of Afghans might die, 
And for that reason, uh, I think uh, everyone uh, is right now very concerned mm -hmm. and everyone hopes that these negotiations in Kabul will result in a new um, inclusive government. Okay, uh, inshallah, Sangar. I have, I have three more questions. If we can make them bullet points, like one minute responses, that would be great, inshallah. Okay. Uh, okay, ahead. so Ahmed Shah Masoud. This uh, he seems like he's Emirati. He seems like he's Emirati backed. Do you think there's a future for him in actually regaining some territory, or is it futile? Uh, he's isolated in a valley, and uh, they don't even have a landing strip. Okay. Uh, they cannot receive supplies, and uh, you cannot airlift everything with helicopters. So, this is it's, it's, it's not a very successful uh, resistance movement. Okay. And uh, the second question I wanted to ask was, uh, you know, the, the state of the woman, women's rights under the Taliban. Is it exaggerated when they say that women aren't allowed to go to school or is it actually true? Do you think this is going to change with the new administration, the new Taliban 2.0, as they phrase it? It's very insensitive of you to invite me for a whole podcast and just ask one question about women. <laughs> Don't you feel ashamed? <laughs> You're right. All right, let's make it two minute responses then. <laughs> no, no, look, I think that all the concerns about women in Afghanistan under Taliban are legitimate. Yeah. Their regime in the 1990s was terrible for women. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, uh, the Taliban are doing their best to appear as very tolerant towards women. But uh, women's rights in Afghanistan, uh, you know, we need as a society to collectively uh, make an effort to uh, be uh, more tolerant and more uh, respectful uh, towards everyone, mm -hmm. not just women. Mm -hmm. And sadly, because of all the problems, uh, women, because they are weaker, they uh, they suffer the most. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, and this is why uh, the negotiations and this is why the all different voices need to be involved they need to be actively involved and come with a solution where everyone's rights are protected and safeguarded and uh for that reason you know people who have concerns they need to get involved okay they need to be involved in the negotiation with the taliban they didn't they don't need to run away and escape the country because uh if everyone leaves the country uh well then there is no negotiation and everything will be as the Taliban wish it to be. And I don't think most people in Afghanistan would want that. Okay. All right. Thank you. And last question. Um, so, you know, the Turks, the Turks are very eager to have some kind of control over Kabul airport. Erdogan is, you know, saying that, hey, you know, yes, we were part of NATO, but we were non-combat forces. We're actually good guys. We want to, you know, you guys should let us take the airport. And Taliban don't seem too enthusiastic about that. Uh, what are your comments about that? Um, I would say that uh, any country which allows its international airport or any person who allows its international airport to be controlled uh, by a foreign entity does not believe in independence. So uh, it's a violation of Afghanistan's independence to have a foreign country come and control its uh, most important international port, which is the air airport. Mm -hmm. uh, and for that reason, uh, the Turkish uh, desires to uh, be involved in Afghanistan are uh, not perceived as friendly, not just mm -hmm. by Taliban, but most Afghans who have uh, some knowledge of politics and uh, regional affairs, they know that uh, uh, we need to eliminate all sorts of foreign involvement in Afghanistan to create some sort of stability. Mm -hmm. Because if, if, if Turkey gets the airport, then some other country will say, we want some other part of the country. We want this or we want that. And then we as Afghans will have to then try to appease uh, all these other actors. And this will lead further to more conflict. And for that reason, I think that uh, Turkish uh, desires to control the airbase, uh, airport or any other part of the country is not beneficial for Afghans and most Afghans don't perceive that as uh, something positive. Thank you. Thank you, Sangar. I want to end it with uh, a comment I had. Uh, so I'm, I'm originally from a city called Tripoli, Lebanon. 
And, um, you know, they used to, in the Lebanese media, Lebanese media, there's a lot of Islamophobic elements within the Lebanese media. And they used to label, uh, they used to label Tripoli as the Kandahar of Lebanon. I don't know if you've ever heard of this before, <laughs> but because yeah, Tripoli, yeah. yeah, Tripoli is a conservative city. So I just, I just, I just really want to, um, real quick, uh, Kandahar at the moment, does it have electricity? Yes. Does it have water? Yes. Okay, perfect. I just want everybody, every Lebanese person who's listening to this to know that the city they make fun of, which is Kandahar, has running water, has electricity, yeah. and it's a functioning city, whereas the totality of Lebanon is a complete disaster and it's a failed state would, and falling apart. I just want to I say would that. Advise, I would advise your uh, audience to go on YouTube and look for uh, Kandahar vlogs by Qawi Khan. This Qaf, you know? Okay. K Q A Q A W I Khan uh, Khan okay. as K H A N. Okay. Uh, he's a vlogger from Kandahar. You can see how uh, the city is uh, very well developed. Some parts of the city they have big boulevards. There is uh, there are trees. Especially there is a neighborhood in Kandahar called Ainomina. Mm -hmm. uh, we had the architect of that uh, neighborhood on our podcast. Uh, yeah, nice. so uh, Kandahar is is pretty well developed compared to other parts of Afghanistan. Okay, that's good. That's good to hear. And uh, thanks for sharing that uh, that vlogger, uh, Sangar. I appreciate so much your time, man. I had such a great time having you on and sharing your knowledge about Afghanistan and the recent events. May Allah Subhanahu wa Taala reward you. Uh, thank you so Ameen. much for being on. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me and yes. uh, may Allah reward you for all your efforts. And uh, who knows, maybe uh, we can uh, do a podcast on our platform and talk yeah. about inshallah. similarities between uh, Lebanon and Afghanistan. Inshallah, inshallah, definitely. I'm, I'm very down for that. And with that, I want to thank the audience for listening in today. Uh, please feel free to follow Afghan Eye on Twitter and you can follow Sangar's uh, Twitter handle as well. Would you mind sharing that Twitter handle, Sangar? Yes, yeah, so my Twitter handle is uh, P for Papa, A for Alpha, Y, K for Kilo, H for Hotel, A for Alpha, R for Romeo, Paikar. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, and I appreciate it, and hope everyone has a good day. Thank you.